All right. Welcome back from lunch. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Good? Yeah. Good? Come on, guys. A little more energy than that. We did. We got it. We still got, we still got on the button. I think we covered that. Uh, so, hey, my name is Mike Pfeiffer. I, uh, I work at Amazon. Not actually here to sell books. I work at Amazon Web Services. You might have heard of us. We do stuff in the cloud. And uh, just want to talk about some of the stuff that we're doing. We do have a PowerShell module um, that's been around for a couple years. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm uh, just going to take you guys through some of the basics um, just to kind of get you up to speed. And then time permitting towards the end, we'll see if we can launch something actually kind of useful uh, using some of this stuff. So my backstory is I'm a solutions architect at AWS. Uh, I spent years and years as a huge PowerShell enthusiast. I still am. Um, I, I went to the first kind of like PowerShell deep dive thing that we had. It was kind of like a summit. I guess it was like the first summit in a way. Um, I guess it was five or six years ago. And uh, at the time, I was running the PowerShell user group um, in Phoenix with a friend of mine that you guys might know. who's an MVP now. His name is Jason Helmick. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody <laughs> booing? <laughs> oh, so, I so wish he was here to hear that. He would love that. Um, but uh, if you ever see him, Ask him about the interesting time we had coming to the first summit. We actually uh, totaled a rental car, basically. So that was kind of an interesting time. So it was a good story. Um, but anyway, that's kind of my background. You can catch me on Twitter if you ever want to holler at me on anything. Um, not on there as much as I used to be. Um, and before the days of working at Microsoft and Amazon, I was an MVP for a while. Wrote a couple PowerShell uh, cookbooks for Exchange, so that was kind of fun. And uh, so I'm still a geek at heart for PowerShell. So. Super excited to be here and uh, honored, especially with all the people in the room. Uh, it's quite an honor to be here. So what I'm going to cover again is I'm just going to kind of give you guys high level on Amazon Web Services so it all makes sense. I'm just going to take you through the tools, setups, how do you, can, you know, launch servers, virtual machines. We call them instances. All right, we'll kind of take a look at that. Um, adding storage to those guys, finding them, tagging them bootstrapping, which is a big thing. Uh, we have a lot of services. I'm going to focus mainly on EC2, the Elastic Compute Cloud, which is where all the virtual machines are. Because um, you know we're all Windows focused, want to talk about launching Windows environments. But you know with the vast amount of services, you can do all kinds of things with Amazon. But I'm kind of just going to home in on, on the virtual machines on the instances. All right. Hopefully, when we get to the end, if we still have some time, uh, we'll talk about deploying well-architected environments. So it's easy to spin up a bunch of virtual machines, but one of the things I do is I spend a lot of my time working with enterprise customers that want to take things like SQL Server and Exchange, you know, obviously Active Directory and things like that, and put that in the cloud. And obviously there's a lot of security concerns there, how do you design it, how do you deploy it. You can use PowerShell to do all of that work. You can use a bunch of other tools that we have. So it kind of depends on, on who's interested in working on this stuff. I just did a partner deep dive last week, and I had a lot of feedback of partners saying, hey, I already know PowerShell, so that's what I live and work on. So that's what we're going to use initially to kind of get started so we can get started quickly. So if that's what the tool is that you know, that's a, a great way to get started. Uh, a little bit about the global infrastructure. There's 10 reason, uh, regions worldwide. Regions are made up of multiple availability <laughs> zones, which are basically data centers within those regions. So there's always <clears throat> There's always two availability zones in every region. Uh, the closest one here, of course, is going to be the Ireland region. And we're constantly adding stuff all of the time. Uh, talk a little bit about edge locations up here. 49 across the world, that's for our content delivery network. So that's you know, more about web delivery, web hosting type scenario. Uh, but I'll take you guys through the regions and things like that. Essentially, they're completely independent of each other, though. So you know, if you wanted to have machines in one region talking to machines in another, Right now, that's going to be like a VPN connection cross regions, something like that. That traffic goes over the internet. Typically, what most folks do is they'll pick a region, they'll launch their solution within that region in a couple of availability zones. So they've got failover between two different data centers. So think about you know Northern California is a common one that we use in the U.S. Uh, three availability zones there. So that's one way you can kind of uh, carve things up. Eventually, we'll also have peering between regions where native connectivity actually exists. Uh, so you can deploy your apps out there. Uh, in terms of products, I don't know if you guys have ever gone and looked at the list of things that we have. Obviously, we've got virtual machines, but we have you know, big data. We've got mobile analytics. We've got storage services for all kinds of different things. Uh, so the list goes on and on. There's over like 40 different services. 
Uh, so I would definitely encourage you guys to check some of that out. But um, you know, after looking at the global infrastructure, the networking, compute, storage, and database are the big ones. So compute is that Elastic Compute Cloud. The storage is kind of two components. We've got uh, a block storage service. Um, it's got some pretty screaming fast performance. We've got object storage. Uh, and then on the database side, we've got some managed relational database services. So if you wanted to do uh, a particular flavor of SQL Server, you could do that. Uh, some other versions as well. You could also bring your own SQL Servers in, like SQL Server Enterprise, and do things like that. Finally, up at the top layers, we've got application services, deployment and administration. So you know, we can use PowerShell to deploy all of our services and all of our solutions. We can also use things like CloudFormation, uh, which is kind of like an automation orchestration tool. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. But that integrates nicely with PowerShell. All right. So we actually have, you know, every one of our services can be interfaced with uh, over some kind of web, a web, a uh, web API. And um, you know, at the end of the day, you can pick whatever library you want to work with those services. You can use Java, you can use .NET. Uh, we have a .NET SDK team that works on a tool set um, specifically for .NET, of course. And then those are the guys that are responsible for building the PowerShell commandlets uh, that run for AWS. And they've been doing that for about two years. And it's kind of interesting that the team is you know, a fairly tight-knit team, and they're very focused on working on the .NET SDK. And the, their decision was, let's continue to focus on that piece of this tooling and this, this offering. Um, it, but we want to also add PowerShell support, but we don't want to have a whole team working <coughs> on commandlets dedicated to that and duplicating some efforts. So the way they do it today is um, they have a code generation tool that uses reflection to reflect across, across the, uh, the .NET uh, SDK, and it produces commandlets based off of that. So sometimes. Um, that makes commandlets that are very good. Sometimes that makes commandlets uh, that need a little bit of extra work. So, so we've got a handful of commandlets that need some, some special attention. Uh, but by and large, that's kind of how they do it. Uh, and you know, sometimes it can be challenging because essentially they're taking the API methods from those services and trying to generate a, a commandlet for that. Um, you know, an example would be we have a stop instances uh, API method that turns off a virtual machine. Um, so stop is a... a a perfect verb for that, um, for that commandlet, right? We also have terminate, which is not like an approved, you know, terminate instances, that's, terminate's not really an approved verb, right? So then they gotta start thinking on those scenarios. So then that's when maybe they'll com combine two API methods into a single command or something like that. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the development team's very eager uh, for people's feedback. Um, I know we've gotten some feedback from MVPs that are using AWS, which is awesome. And uh, if you actually go into our, our developer forums and post things, the, the guys in there are very responsive. I really want to take your feedback and actually integrate that into the product. So it's not like your request would go into a black hole if you want to give feedback. Uh, it's, it's very closely monitored. Only have a few more slides, and then I'll go into complete demo mode here. Um, to get up and running, I know there's a couple people that are doing AWS, so you have an account already. If you don't, you just need to sign up. All right. If you guys are interested in kind of kicking the tires, grab me in between a session. I've got uh, $50 uh, gift cards, so you can plug that in and kind of get started and play around a little bit. Um, but uh, you have to have an account. You've got to have PowerShell 2 or later. You download and install the tools for PowerShell. So if you go to aws.amazon.com slash PowerShell, you actually install the .NET SDK. That will install the module for you. And you can customize the install and just grab the PowerShell piece if you want to do that. Right. Uh, keep an eye on the .NET blog here. And then, of course, the forums where we want to give that feedback. All right. So with that, that's kind of the 50,000 view foot kind of overview. Questions so far? I'll just go straight into some demo. Anybody, I know a couple of you I've talked to are on AWS. Is anybody else using AWS for stuff? OK. Anybody using the commandlets? A few people? All right. Let me know your feedback while we're here. So let me start off with a couple things. After you've installed the toolkit, right, you're going to have to authenticate, obviously, to the services when you're running your commands. Uh, there's a few ways to do that. Let me just take you into uh, the console real quick and just show something to kind of uh, <coughs> give you an idea. And i got to redo my wireless here. 
So if you guys want to come by later, I'm in room 751. <laughs> the liquor cabinet is empty though, so. <laughs> Yeah, right. No, no service. I'm now connected. Okay. So let me go in and sign in here. Now, typically, what we have is we have this concept of having a root account. I'm clicking and nothing's happening. There we go. So, root account is essentially um, an administrator for all of your services. And if you have an older account, you have something called access keys that you can use to authenticate to the services when you make API calls. That's with uh, any of the you know, SDK tools from any language and also PowerShell. Uh, but what you want to do basically is use a sub-user of your account and use those access keys from there. That way, if your account ever gets compromised or that user is compromised, then you can just disable that user and your whole entire account isn't uh, compromised. But we have this service called Identity and Access Management, or IAM. And if I come in here under users, you can see that I have a user named Mike. That's who I'm signed in up here, Mike at MikePF, which is my account. Come down and look at the bottom, we've got access keys. So even though Mike has sign-in credentials, a username and password, uh, we don't use those credentials to authenticate uh, to our PowerShell um, API calls through PowerShell. We use a set of access keys that are right over here. You click on manage keys, it'll generate the access keys for you, and then you need to save them um, because you can never retrieve them again after you've kind of generated that. It'll let you download kind of the password of that key pair, which would be the, uh, the secret key. But then from then on, we don't store that information, all right? You can regenerate them over and over, but the thing to take away from it is it's not a username and password, it's a set of access keys, and it's like that for all of the other APIs, all right? So I've actually got mine stored in variables, so I've got access key, secret access key, so I don't have to type them out over and over. Uh, and the thing is, is you don't want to embed those in any scripts or any code that you're uh, checking in anywhere, right? We had somebody um, actually put in their, in their code the access keys, checked it into like a public uh, GitHub repo. Next thing you know, somebody went and blew up uh, all the resources in their account. So it's the best practice not to embed those. And what I mean by that is you could say, you know, get EC2 instance. Again, instances are the virtual machines. Uh, you could say access key. Provide your access key, secret key, of course, uh, and then authenticate that way, get your results back. The best practice is not to do that. Um, and I'm using variables here, usually people are putting literal values in there. So the concept is don't do that and set up something called profiles. The SDK will do three things for you, um, and it's kind of you know, intercepting all of your calls from PowerShell. So there's this concept of a, a secure credential store that's managed by the SDK. You generate that profile, it's encrypted. Um, there's also a concept of setting up something called an IAM role, uh, where we can attach a role to an instance, and then the keys are just passed in when the API calls are made. So you don't have to authenticate. It keeps code out of, or it keeps credentials out of your code. Uh, so that's, that's another way that you can kind of do this. But if you look at uh, get AWS credentials, list stored, I've got two out there. My profile configuration uses those credentials that have been created. Uh, so let me just blow them away real quick, and I'll show you how to set them up properly here. So I'm just going to clear the one I have called PSH. Let me recheck that, what it was actually called. Okay, default. Yeah, it wants a parameter name, stored credentials. There we go. And I usually don't have to nuke these, but I want to show you how to start over from scratch and then default. So now if I were to call a command, it wouldn't work because I'd have no, no way to authenticate, right? So uh, if you do get AWS credentials again, list your credentials, nothing there, right? So what you can do is set AWS credentials, access key, secret key, and that's one way you can do it. You can tell it to store as PSH, right? Now you've got a set of stored credentials that are now encrypted on this machine. And from there, you know, if I did a get EC2 instance, I could say uh, profile, PSH. Then I would have to specify that region because the command list don't know what region you're in. You want to tell it that. By default, it doesn't figure that out. So I could say something like US West 1, 
which is going to be Northern California. And then that would work, right? I have no machines there. The command ran and I was OK. Uh, but what I don't want to have to do is type in the profile and the region every single time, right? So to give, go even further, you can initialize your defaults. You can tell it, of course, the keys and all that. But you can also specify the profile name. So I can do that profile I can create it, create it and I can say US West 1. Uh, and then that would give me the ability to, after that point, do get EC2 instance. Remember, I have no virtual machines, but it does still run. And if you look at your AWS credentials, we now have the default that, that was created <laughs> when I did the initialize, and then the PSH. All right. So that's all in our documentation, but that's kind of what you got to do to get started to get the command set up and running. All right. Uh, if you're not sure what the regions are, you saw me type that one in. I, you memorize them after a while, right? But what you can do is you can do a get AWS region. That will tell you which ones are out there. Again, we have 10. There's one on here that's not listed, which is the uh, United States government region. It's called the GovCloud. Uh, but you can see that since I initialized my defaults, Northern California is now true for that, uh, for that profile. All right, and so from there, um, there's this concept of figuring out what image you want to use to build your virtual machines. Uh, so we've got you know thousands of ones that we maintain, all kinds of different Linux images. We've got Windows images. Uh, we've got community-based images that other people provide. Uh, so there's tons out there. And there is a commandlet called uh, get ec2 image that will return them all. But if you actually run this, it would take forever because there's liter literally tens of thousands, right? So if you're working uh, in a Windows environment, an easy way to do this, if you do a git uh, ec2 image by name, it's a kind of a weird commandlet, but it's just a way to help you figure out what images are out there. If you run it without any parameters, you can see that we have all kinds of different flavors of Windows Server. We've got 2012 R2. We've got ones with SQL Server baked in. All right. So the cool thing about doing Windows on here is that the licensing's all figured out for you. So when you go launch a Windows Server 2012 R2 instance, um, that's licensed under SPLA. So uh, you don't have to worry about bringing your own server license. It just works, right? So the, the money you pay per minute or per hour covers that licensing cost. Same thing with some of these other SQL SKUs that we have out there. So SQL Server Web, Express, Standard. Notice that there's no SQL Server Enterprise yet. That's something I'm hoping that will change someday at some point. It makes life easier. Um, but pretty much what you would do here is figure out this friendly name for the image. And if you run it again with that friendly name, like for example, Windows 2012R2 underscore base, essentially a bare OS, right, for the latest operating system. Uh, if you select just the name, and the image ID, uh, you'll notice there's multiple. And the reason for that is we update them very frequently. So typically about five days after Patch Tuesday, we try to get a new image with the latest updates in it. So the one at the top is always going to be that latest image. So that's going to be one that it's truncated here, but that's from like two weeks ago. All right, so you want to get the AMI image ID if you wanted to create a server 2012 R2 server, but it's also specific to the region that you're in. So since I'm in Northern California right now, that image name is actually specific to Northern California. So if I tried to create an instance using that image in Ireland, it would fail. So this could, this could be kind of <coughs> tricky, um, especially if you know, you're deploying all over the world. So that's one thing to watch out for. Usually you know, what you can do is if you're always working in the same region, of course, you can expand that name property and say, give me the first one, of course, and then just kind of save that in a variable. That way, you don't have to keep constantly running that over and over again. Because typically, um, you know, from what I've seen, most of the customers uh, are grabbing uh, the latest version of Windows Server 2012 R2. What I wanted to do there was expand image ID, not name. So let's do that again. So it's, it's always the first, or do you have a date timestamp? Uh, there is a date timestamp, yes. Yeah, it's a good question. It's actually on there. It's uh, If I just select that one. Oh, not stored in, in, in a variable, though. Let's do that again. So the one that's 2014, September 10th, um, and that's the one that you want to grab. 
There's no property date time. Property date. Right. Yeah. So as I said, this command looks a little weird. It's in the actual name. Yeah. That, yeah, that doesn't happen, right? Um, you know, it's very rare that, that I've seen the images get recalled. Uh, it's definitely possible. At that point, though, it's basically something that you would have to launch another instance with with a different uh, image ID there. And you also have to be careful because some of these will get deprecated, right? So notice there's May, and then we skip forward to July. June's missing, so sometimes they'll get deprecated forever. That might be because there was something in that one that wasn't any good. So you kind of got to keep an eye on that. Yeah. Um, what's the reason why you have different images for different regions? Yeah, that's a, a big pain point for a lot of people, and it's a common question. It's like, how do we get a single unified API call that'll get us the right one wherever we're at? Uh, and it basically all comes down to those regions being kind of uh, on their own, right? So their storage services. Uh, are completely uh, independent, and uh, th it was a de decision on the design side to use unique names. Um, is there compliance too? I mean, with like like you have different versions of Windows. So there's an N and a K, uh, depending on the uh, compliance <coughs> issues. So some some features have been taken out because of the antitrust or whatever. So we have different images because of that, possibly. So they're different SKUs. Uh, it could be. Yeah. Right now, it's it's pretty vanilla. Yeah. But they all set in sort of default US cal across the board. Is that the way they start out? Uh, default US cal. Low cal. Oh, low cal, yeah, yeah. And that's that's something you can you can customize. These are the ones. These are the stock images that we provide. A lot of people will do uh, what they call baking AMIs. Well, they'll take this one, they'll customize it the way that they want it. They'll sysprep it, shut it down. They'll create their own image off of it. Um, and that that's a pretty interesting way to do deployments because a lot of times. You know, if you're trying to bootstrap these images from scratch without any kind of you know, work on the front end, you're installing all kinds of um, additional Windows Server roles, getting the server ready to go. So sometimes you can find a balance between either fully baking all of your stuff into an Im image or partially baking some stuff to speed up that deployment time. All right, so that's kind of the story on, on the images there. And uh, some of the stuff that we have as well is uh, kind of going back to the other question, global storage. So something like simple storage <laughs> service S3, um, everything has to be unique, every file has to be unique. So that might feed into the image names there. Eventually, I hope that uh, you know we'll have something where uh, we have one image name wherever you go. Well, let's see, I just want to make sure that I get that image name captured here. So there we go. So now that I know the image name, I got to know that when I want to create an EC2 instance, right? So if I do new, new EC2 instance, image ID was going to be that one that I had there, right? Then what you can do is a min count of one and a max count of like 10 if you wanted to. You can omit both these parameters, it'll just do one instance, um, but you know, if you want to deploy a, a large fleet, this is one way that you would do that. Uh, and this also kind of ties into a concept that we have is, uh, called auto scaling. So uh, you can create auto scaling groups and this is a good use case for applications that have like a web tier, an application tier. You need to be able to respond to some kind of high utilization situation, and you need to scale out that tier in your application. Uh, so you can create a scaling group that kind of does something like this where, okay, if we get 75% CPU utilization over a period of five minutes, 10 minutes, we know we need to scale horizontally. Let's add two more instances. And then when the load goes back down, you can deprovision uh, those instances. Right? So I'm, not, I'm just going to create one, so I'm going to get rid of these. So I do need to know the instance type. And we don't have a commandlet that tells us what the instance types are. You can get this stuff on the website. I'll actually show you in the console kind of how to do this. Actually, let's just do that real quick so you can kind of get a frame of reference here. Let me hop over to uh, EC2. I'm going to launch an instance in here. Here's where you pick all the images. These are all the ones that we build. Notice that you have your own AMIs you can pick. There's stuff in the marketplace that vendors put out there. Uh, but here's that Windows Server 2012 R2 base. So I'm just going to pick that. And then here's the instance types. And it's asking you, you know, what type of computer do you want to use? Do you want to use a general purpose, which has got a decent amount of RAM? Do you want to use something that's really hardcore that has 240 gigs of RAM? 
and 16 or 32 processor cores, that kind of thing. Uh, we also, you know, have this concept of instant storage, which would be like a, a true physical local disk. But the root volume where the C drive is is always on that elastic block store storage, which is network attached. All right, and that's by default these days SSD backed storage. Uh, and typically, you know, if you use that, the servers will boot much quicker. Uh, so if you didn't know what the instance types were, they're here in the list they're under this type column right here. I picked an M3.xlarge. That's going to be four vCPUs, 15 gigs of RAM, a couple of 40 uh, gig SSDs um, that are ephemeral. If you power the instance off, the data on those SSDs goes away. All right. So uh, be very careful with that um, in terms of using stuff that you want to persist. When you come over to instance details, uh, you can pick the network and the subnet that all this stuff goes into. There's a default VPC. You'll see that in here, uh, especially with your newer accounts. We didn't always have this. If it's been around for a while, if you sign up today, you're going to be using VPC only. But uh, this is basically your own private network in the cloud. It's completely isolated from everybody else. So you could literally have the same network and multiple accounts that have the same exact IP addresses. It's all completely private and isolated. All right? Typically, what we do is with customers, they'll build their own VPCs. Uh, because this one's kind of just out on the internet, so to speak. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, you can choose to assign a public IP right here. One question. Yeah. VPC stands for virtual private cloud? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Question was, what does VPC stand for in its virtual private cloud? Um, auto assigning a public IP here basically just gives you um, a public IP without any kind of static setting. So if you were to shut down the instance, reboot it, whatever, you could potentially lose that. We do have a concept of, a, of an elastic IP, which is permanent. You, you allocate that IP, you own it. You can assign it to an instance. If that instance dies, you can always attach it to another one later. As long as you've allocated it, you can keep reusing it over and over again. Um, and hit next, here's where you can add some additional storage. So the one on the top is that the general purpose block store volume, that 30 gig is going to be your root disk. Um, and notice with the IOPS, it actually tells you you're going to have 90 out of 3,000 with this. That's because with general purpose volumes, we actually give you three IOPS per gigabyte, and it's burstable to 3,000. So the first 30 minutes that you power on that instance, we'll let you burst up to 3,000 IOPS on that C drive, on that root disk, so you can boot the system up faster, so it doesn't take as long to deploy your servers. Uh, and we also have a different type called provisioned IOPS that, that lets you do explicit IOPS up to 4,000. And then, of course, there's magnetic, which means no SSD. It's going to be pretty slow, right? So those are the three different types. And again, that's all network-connected storage. Uh, we make multiple copies of those uh, within your availability zone, so you get some durability there on the data, right? Hitting next, you can tag the instance. Um, and tagging is actually a pretty important thing because you could literally end up with hundreds of servers, especially if you're building you know, dev, task, QA all in the same region. You could have a list of multiple servers. Tagging gives you a way to distinguish the servers from each other, what stack are they a part of, that kind of thing. So use these things like crazy. Uh, and this is all stuff we'll do through PowerShell, just showing it to you here so you can kind of visualize it. Security groups are essentially a host-based firewall. Right? It's a stateful firewall that you can assign to your instances. And you can assign it to more than one. So you can create one group, for example, that has an ingress rule that permits like remote desktop. right? Uh, and then you can assign that to multiple servers if you want a remote desktop into them. Um, and here's the port rules that we're looking at right here. Um, they give you, by default, uh, an RDP rule with this subnet ID or this source address of where you're coming from anywhere in the world. Typically, we ask you to lock that down. Right? We don't want anybody in the world to be able to RDP into your system. And if you just picked my IP from there, it actually figures out what your IP address is. So you can do that. This is all stuff that you can do through PowerShell as well. But once you get to the end, you're ready to go. You're ready to launch an instance. So the nice thing about scripting this stuff, if you wanted to build an environment um, with you know, a couple domain controllers, a couple SQL servers, a couple web servers, you can do that all in PowerShell code. You can do that in some of the other tools that we have as well. So just kind of seeing what that would look like in PowerShell, the new EC2 instance commandlet is pretty much what's driving that wizard. The image ID is what you picked off the list. The instance type, again, picked off that list. There's another concept known as a key name that you need to use. So 
we actually do not store the Windows password. Um, it, what we ask you to do is generate a key pair. We use the key pair, the public key, to encrypt the password. We give you the private key. We don't store that. Uh, so we can never get into the instance and see what's running in there. You own that. You need to keep that key pair. It's a pen file that you'll get when you, when you create it in the particular region that you're going to deploy to. Uh, but you need to save that if you want to be able to decrypt the password. Uh, the other option is, is don't provide a key and then set the password in a startup script that you know what it is. I'll show you how to do that. Um, but that's, that's what the key name is all about here. All right? And what happens is a Windows instance will come up. There's a service on that box that will decrypt it um, or that will encrypt it and will let you decrypt it once you want to log in. But it does take a few minutes after you launch the instance to be able to do that. All right? So if you run it like that, what you get back is a collection or a reservation more specifically. Notice that there's not a lot of interesting stuff there uh, because it's embedded within this instance's property. So within that would be that one through 10 instances that you might have created or something like that. On this one, we only did one, right? So uh, at, at this point, it's a little hard to get at that. Typically what I do is I'll say that in a variable because everything's tied together using IDs. So the ID of this instance might go into another VPC and I need to kind of keep track of that kind of stuff. So it can get a little confusing. What I usually do is this, is when I launch the instance, I'll save it in a variable, dollar sign I or whatever, select and expand that instances property. That way when you look at that variable, you actually have that one instance, right? So I just wanted to create one and that's what I did there. Uh, so now it's booting up. It's actually going to give it a, pro a public IP address because I launched it into that default VPC. That default VPC has an internet gateway, so as long as it's got a public IP on the instance, it can go right out to the internet. Uh, some people don't like that, and that's when you start creating your own VPCs, creating like DMZ type subnets, putting your application servers and private subnets behind that type of thing, right? But now that the instance is created, you know, there's that concept of maybe tagging it because if you look in here, I'm just going to cancel this, go under instances, change this to the right place, California. Notice that the two that I launched are initializing, they have no name. Right? <coughs> so if I specify a name tag, then the name will actually show up in this column here, which is actually very nice because you don't really know what you're looking at otherwise unless you dig into the properties. So um, normally what you can do here, and this is useful to do in a script, is run new EC2 tag. The resource in question would be the actual uh, instance ID and then your tag. And you can basically pass in an array of tags. Um, you've got a little bit of a weird key value pair syntax that you have to use here. So it takes a little practice, uh, and you'll see this in, in the documentation, but you have to specify a key, which would be in this case name, and value, which would be the name of your server. So something like that. And it took me a while to, to remember the syntax there, um, but again, it's just something that you got to get used to. Um, yeah, so that's it. Another thing to point out, even though PowerShell is uh, case insensitive, right? Here, if you don't use the capital N for the key name, it won't show up in that list. That's something I'm trying to get people on my side to kind of make consistent. Uh, but you know, you go run that, come back in here, do a refresh, and now you can see SRV02 under the name column, right? And you do as much tags as you want there. Yeah. If you have a hash table, you can pipe it to get properties. If you have a if you have a hash table, can you pipe it to that? I don't believe that parameter actually accepts input via the pipeline. Um, so that's something you could check, but probably not. Uh, anybody listen to power scripting podcasts? Yeah. So a couple of months ago, it might have been four or five months ago, uh, Steve Roberts from the uh, .NET SDK team was on the show. And uh, he's, you know, he's one of the main guys on the team that's working on the PowerShell commandlets. One of the things he wants to try to make a little better is the pipelining experience. So he's trying to work on that. And, uh, so that's, you know, you, what you'll find is there's going to be some commands where pipeline experience could probably be a little better. All right. Yeah. You're showing the commands now because you know the commands. How is the quality of the help in the commands? 
since I know the command was housed, the quality of the output? No, no, of the, the help. Uh, oh, the help? Yeah. So, yeah, that's another good question. So, <laughs> there's a lot of commandlets that the help isn't in there yet. Um, and that's, you know, th that's because it's a small team managing the PowerShell commands, also because they're automatically generated. So, folks like in the solutions architecture practice are trying to help out with providing examples there. And what we're finding, you know, the, we've only had commandlets for two years, so the adoption and now is starting to grow. Uh, it's pretty surprising. We do have a lot of Windows workloads on AWS, and you know, you, you think of AWS as a startup type of cloud provider, but we've got tons and tons of Windows folks on AWS. Like I said last week, I was in Seattle working with a bunch of partners. All these guys are moving all kinds of stuff, Exchange servers, and SQL, all kinds of stuff. So um, as Windows continues to grow, I definitely see more investments in the commandlets, more time spent. And hopefully every single commandlet will have you know, 10 or 12 examples. So that's, the, <coughs> that's gonna be awesome when we get to that point. Uh, good questions so far. So the other concept here is uh, you know, being able to search and filter on those tags, right? There was a, something earlier session where we talked about you know, filtering early versus filtering late, right? So there is a filter parameter and this is a parameter on every command that's actually pretty well documented. So uh, if you wanted to find an EC2 instance that had a specific tag, you could pass in one to this filter parameter. And again, this is going to be a hash table, right? But this is a, another one that gets a little bit tricky. So here you would say something like this name, tag colon name something like that, values equals SRV02. And not quite the right syntax there. I think I missed that. And put it away from the name, the left side of the name. Ah, uh, yeah, thank you. So as you can see, a little, a little tricky there. The thing that throws me off is I don't know if you noticed earlier when I created the tag, the uh, this key here was value and not values. So that's a little bit hard to remember, um, but uh, that's something to watch out for. So you know, if you look at the filter parameters help here, if you do a help on get EC2 instance on the parameter filter, it actually shows you all of the values that you can filter on. Uh, so I do find myself using this one like crazy. Uh, again, you're gonna be searching through tons of different instances in most environments. So, uh, you know, and that's kind of, hard to read, but it tells you right here, you know, the network interface status, you know, things like that, uh, tags, all kinds of different stuff. All right, so in that case, reading the help, definitely a useful thing. Um, there's also that concept of security groups and creating nodes from the shell. Uh, so if you did a get EC2 security group, that's gonna be that host based firewall. Uh, by default, you can see that I get my default VPC security group uh, and if you look at the IP permissions property, there's going to be some ACLs in there. That could be an inbound or an outbound ACL. Uh, if you look at that property, IP permissions, you can see that there's very little there in, in terms of information, right? So typically what we do is we'll create explicit security groups to assign uh, two instances. There's a commandlet to create the groups, uh, but there is not a commandlet to create the ingress rules. Uh, so let me just show you that real quick. Uh, so it's good to know, right? So if you did new EC2 security group, group name, RDP, even though you guys probably think RDP is evil, right? Because you want to do all command line administration, no graphical uh, type of stuff, but give it a description. So that creates the, the group, right? but the group has no rules on it, right? There's no inbound rules there. So from there, you actually have to construct your rules uh, using something uh, a little bit different, right? So you have to construct your own object, basically. So you have to do like a new object, um, amazon.ec2.model.ip permission. And now that particular rule is blank. You go through and populate the from port, the IP protocol, the IP ranges, then there's a commandlet to assign that ingress rule to the security group. Yeah? What port numbers need to be open to, to connect? Yeah, so if you want to do like an RDP connection, 
be TCP port 3389. Yeah, so here you, here you do, you would actually come in and configure your to and from ports. Those will be the same in this particular example, so it's not going to be a port range, right? You would do uh, the IP protocol, which would be TCP, right? And then you would do IP dot IP ranges dot add. And then in here you could say something like 0, .0, .0, 0, .0, 0, 0, 0, 0.0.0.0 slash 0, which would be everything, right? And then now you've built that, that rule basically. Now you can grant either ingress or, or egress or ingress uh, on the security group, right? So you would say ingress, you would say the security group. Um, group ID right there, which would be you know something like SG, something like that, and then you would say the actual IP permissions would be IP. So it's worth noting, on RDP, we changed the firewall rules in the later versions of Windows so that it's uh, denied on public networks. So you can access, it's open on private networks, it's open on the range right now. Right. But if RDP on your public network is by default off, yeah. that's a change. Right. Yeah, and that's interesting because that's on the Windows firewall, right? Yes. Yeah, so on this, on this thing, this is actually in addition to your Windows firewall. So that's like a two-step thing you might have to think about there. Um, is it really 40 past already? Is that true? We're doing that good on time, huh? So how, I got like four minutes? Okay. Um, so we did have a lot of good questions, so I think you know, that uh, kind of took me into it. What I was going to show, and this will be in the materials you guys can download, it's actually a whole script that'll do this that will build a fairly well-architected environment. Typically, we do things in two AZs for everything, two availability zones, two data centers. But you know, if you had a web application stack that needed Active Directory, you know, you'd have at least a, do a domain controller and a web server in a private subnet. In a public subnet, you would have something like a remote desktop gateway or a PowerShell web access server, whatever you want. You'd also have a NAT instance for outbound internet access because the way that we do all of this is uh, you know, we don't want servers on the inside network to be directly accessible from the internet. So we hook an internet gateway to this VPC, we make a private subnet, or a public subnet rather. These instances can have elastic IPs, so they can get out to the internet. So you can remote into this guy, this guy can go out to the internet. We have a route from this subnet for outbound internet access that goes through <coughs> that gateway. And all that stuff is stuff that you can step through in the code and kind of set up. Um, so I got a script that does that. It's very long and verbose. I also wrote some sample DSC resources that are going to be released like in the next day or two. So you know, if you wanted to use DSC resources to do that, it's a little easier to read, of course. Uh, you can go through and, and use that. Yeah. Is there some way to go for all these sample scripts if you've got like a GitHub repo or something? Yeah, so right now everything's going to be in S3, which is kind of what we use as a GitHub repo. Um, I'm trying to get my team a GitHub repo. Um, if you look out on GitHub, you'll see various teams at Amazon have, have that. The rest of us that still are waiting for ours to get provisioned, um, as stuff stored in S3. And in, in S3, we have version control in there, and we can roll back different versions, so it's kind of like, like that. So initially, it'll be in there after Is the fact. Like yeah. So when you guys get the materials uh, for this session, it'll all be in there. Yeah. Question in the far back? Uh, why do you uh, write uh, DSC resources when you have Cloud Foundation? That's a good question. So why do we do DSC resources if we have Cloud uh, Formation? Uh, so really it's just uh, to get people comfortable with it and <laughs> to show that we got something there as a solution. Uh, like I was talking about last week, we had some folks in the meeting that were like, we showed them Cloud Formation, and they were like, wow, that's heavy. Um, I know PowerShell. Do you have anything PowerShell related, right? And so it's for those use cases. And it's honestly just a sample, um, and it's really just more focused on EC2, like doing you know, instances, security groups, uh, VPCs, internet gateways, and setting up all the routes and stuff. So you know, what you could do is build a configuration script that would build this environment or build an environment across two AZs, run the script, and then let that machine orchestrate the build process. And you know, that's kind of the idea. CloudFormation is probably a little better one because that does do stuff in parallel. Uh, it does allow you to track everything and tear down entire systems at once. So you know that's uh, 
So it's just another option. Did you have another question? Not anymore. Not anymore? Okay. Well, all right, here we go, one more. Yeah, we, we might want to take this one offline. So from a supporting developer perspective, obviously you can have your your production infrastructure running. From a development perspective, what provisions do AWS make available? Does everyone need their own AWS account? Well, you can have one master one for your company and then create those IAM users and then carve things up that way. Uh, the cool thing about IAM too is you can control the roles, so it's you know it's very explicit into creating a policy that says you can describe the instances and that's it. So I can give you a read-only access. Uh, so some people do it differently. Uh, every account does have um, some soft limits. So sometimes people like to you know have different accounts so they don't have to open uh, the soft limits and increase them. Um, but in theory, you could have one and then carve up different users for all of those those folks. So all right, we do not have soft limits. We have parked up at some time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and with that, thanks a lot for listening to me, guys. Was it off? <laughs>